Hey, everybody, this is Lawrence. I'm jumping in the front of this episode because in this episode, we speak a lot about a Zoom conference webinar that was being hosted by the EDD to explain to entertainment industry professionals how to file for unemployment. It was being hosted by IOTC, DGA, SAG, Teamsters, all of the industry leaders. We got an email after we finished recording that it has been canceled. The email states, we are very disappointed to share that we've been informed by the EDD that the unemployment insurance webinar scheduled for this Thursday, April 9th at 10 a.m. is canceled. We are told it will be rescheduled at a later date. We know that many of you share our disappointment and we are committed to applying pressure to reschedule as soon as possible. They still have issues and questions that they are working on, and they are in an all-hands-on-deck mode in implementing the CARES Act which we know many of you have questions on. Some info that the EDD has provided states that all applications for unemployment insurance should indicate that their circumstances are a result of COVID-19. If you are self-employed or an independent contractor, you should not file a claim at this time. Instead, you should wait for further guidance on the application process, which the EDD hopes to release soon. Uh, These are their words, not mine. I suggest doing your own research and making your own opinion, uh, but carrying on. However, if you are unclear as to your proper classification, you can file a claim and the EDD will open an investigation to determine your correct classification. We will do our best to keep you updated. Thank you. Hello, this is Lawrence Lewis. And this is Sister Christian. Today is Tuesday, April 7th, 2020. This is the Producers Happy Hour. Two producers on opposite coasts reaching out to our filmmaking and live event community to hear your stories about how this pandemic has affected you, your life, and your work. Your stories let us know that we're not alone. They definitely help Lawrence and I, so I hope they're helping you guys. It's important for us to keep sharing our experiences and ideas. Email us your stories, or better yet, record a one- to two-minute voice memo and send it to producershappyhour at gmail.com. Just follow the instructions on our website, producershappyhour.com. Please share the show with friends and colleagues. We want these stories to be heard. Uh, Family members are welcome to listen to and anyone else you got out there, just send it along to them. And remember to rate it and review it on the podcast apps that you listen to. I want to get some reviews. Come on, guys. (laughs) That's how, I mean, it's less for our own egos. It's more because that's how (laughs) the show gets recommended to more people when they look at their recommendations. Lawrence, uh, we've known each other. For 14 plus years, let's call it 15 plus years. And you've got to know that it's only about my ego. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, come on. (laughs) I'm so so sorry, (laughs) sister. I should have (laughs) known. So get to it. Great. Get to it. (laughs) Christian, today we're chatting with Sandrine Orabona. I know. I know. She's a documentary filmmaker with over two decades of experience in film, television and advertising. She had a lot of projects in in the works, and of course, everything's kind of in limbo. So I'm interested to see her take on yeah. this whole thing. I think her perspective is going to be pretty valuable in a sense that her career spans all the genres that we've yeah, been talking exactly. about. Even yeah. just like, what is she working on now, and what does she have in the hopper? Or yeah. did every yeah? It's going to be out of getting us out of uh, advertising talk for, for yeah. a day would be nice. So Christian, mm-hmm. Tuesday. <laughs> it's week fucking four. Tuesday. Week four. Yep, we're walking right? into week four right now. Yep. How, how are you holding up? Oh, um, you know, here, here goes. So I think that, you know, it's becoming spring in New York City, which is the most beautiful, amazing time of year. This social distancing is proving to be to be working. I mean, I feel like the news that's coming in from New York has been dire, but it seems to be leveling off at just under capacity dire. Mm -hmm. As much as the wintertime, you know, sucks and it sucked to be inside for the last three and a half weeks, we need to keep doing it because it's what's working. It's the only thing we have. It is the one tool that's working is don't catch it so you don't spread it. Done. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So and 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 if I may add to that, act like you already have it because you could be a pa- yeah. You could be a passive carrier. Exactly. So act, act like you do have it when you're out in public. It was strongly recommended to us by Dr. Burke to not even go to the pharmacy this week. Stock up. Don't leave your house. Right. So yep. to see people out in New York City, it it just hurts. 
physically because it yeah. makes me think that I'm going to need to be doing this longer. It also it makes me think, well, I want to be outside too. <laughs> and I would yeah. like I would like to leave the house too, but I'm not. And so it it just it just oh, Lawrence sent me something that was room tone related. Do you want to just give us the gist of it, Lawrence? <laughs> it said for all you film nerds out there, it was self isolation is like room tone. We all got to be quiet for 30 seconds. And if anybody messes up, we got to start over. Right. And that's why everybody hates room tone. And you, like you I, guys out there are old enough to know, like. I was going to say, I feel like that's a dated, it's already, it's a dated <laughs> meme because we don't really do room tone anymore. But for, for those of us who did. It's a little dated. But if those of you are old enough to know, you know, Michael Lonsdale or, you know, Tony Starbuck or Brenda Ray, some of those people in New York, you know that they, it's like, oh. Got to start over, guys. Yeah. Because <laughs> two people walked across the stage. Yeah. And oh, I'm just feeling a lot of that today. Like, you know, I, I genuinely feel that 90 to 95 percent of society is good and they want to do the right thing in their heart. You know, take yeah. strip out politics, strip out everything else. Mm -hmm. There's 5 percent of people out there that don't think that anything affects them. Yeah, nothing applies to them. Nothing applies to them. And those those 5%, I just feel are, I just want to punch them. I'm not going <laughs> to. But, but the feeling is pretty raw today of yeah. I am moving into week four in a different sense. I feel like my mindset is different. I feel like, okay, I got this. It was very yeah. much what I was hoping it would be last, you know, Monday when we were talking about it. It's very mm -hmm. much that. It's like, okay. Great. I've settled in. I can do this. There's a bit of a routine as haphazard as it is. Yeah. I, I got this. We're all going to be graded on the same scale. Mm -hmm. And I think that we can all earn this by being good citizens. And some of us aren't right now. It's just yeah. very frustrating. Yeah. Oh, hi, Lawrence. How are you today? <laughs> <laughs> hi, Christian. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing just great. Yeah, I notice you're still at home. No, I'm I'm being facetious. I'm good. I mean, emotionally and and all that stuff. Yeah, I'm still at home. I'm going to go back to Joshua Tree. I think tomorrow. I think after chatting with Luke and Michael yesterday, and you know they're talking about the ways forward with film production, right? And what that looks like and mm -hmm. how we're going to do it. And they have they have less of a problem in Australia than we do, so it's a bit more hopeful for them, and they can see a path. Mm -hmm. I'm not quite seeing that path for us. No. And. But. I'm just. Go ahead. What? <laughs> well, I mean, but what I did see from them uh, was my brain beginning to think, okay, so the path is there. Yeah. I don't know that we can see it yet. Yeah. We're looking around at the edge of the forest for the path right now. Yeah, yeah. But we know the path is there. Yeah, I guess that's. Yeah, you're not feeling it. I can tell. <laughs> so go on, please. Sorry, pardon my interruption. Well, I mean, so that's please. all I had. That's all I really can say. I just, uh, yeah, I just am not seeing the path. And, you know, this is all going to end soon. And it's all going to, mm. you know, it's not going to be normal ever again. But yeah, yeah, I guess I'm just struggling, struggling to get there. Well, there's only so many times we can say, hey, we're all in this together and, you know, uh, it'll end know, soon I'm and <laughs> I'm getting tired of it too, to be honest. But I do know that there will be this rally to start back. There will be a, a big movement to. Of course. And I know like, you know, just like we said in uh, some episode, you know, the people, <laughs> that, are not gonna do, <laughs> the people that are not going to do well are kind of the, the doomsdayers and the woe right. is me -ers, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm doing my best not to be that person and trying to be ahead of it all. and. I hear it in your voice today. I know that we're definitely not always on the same page, but I do feel that we're in we're reading the same book. That was <laughs> and, a good analogy. I never thought of uh, that. That's one of my good ones. When I was a PM, this one I used to use all the time. I was like, well, you know, I can definitely explain it to you again, but I can't understand it for you. <laughs> but no, I do think that we're on definitely you know, reading the same <laughs> chapter, but I can definitely tell today that something's up with you. Yeah. Yeah. A little funky. I think my bigger fear is is more the impending financial doom that is ahead of the country, <laughs> and, I and not so know. much not so much film production alone or or right. experiential. That'll all come back when it's time, and it'll figure itself out. I'm not afraid of my adaptability to how we're going to start working again. Right. 
I'm just worried about a bigger, a bigger economic problem. Exactly. Something that yeah. that is beyond our control, yet also our industry is based on that yeah. directly. So, yeah, things are feeling a little bit out of control. A couple of things that Sugar Daddy Cuomo said today <laughs> uh-huh. was two things. One was that it's only been 37 days. Mm. Okay. And that to me was pretty profound because it feels like it's been four years. Or an hour and a half. I know. Simultaneously, I it's been an hour and a half, four years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the second thing um, Governor Cuomo said was, he's like, you know, I, I know it's spring out and it's beautiful and all of these things and it's motorcycle weather and I'd love to be on my motorcycle driving. I was like, oh. Mm. How did perfection just even become yeah. perfectator? And, Wait, and it your, was because your vision of Cuomo riding on a motorcycle, a motorcycle. <laughs> and me like being behind him, <laughs> or like on my own motorcycle uh, riding the sign him, or hilarious. and just having like a you know a governor gang, <laughs> 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 motorcycle gang, and we all get together and we just ride through upstate New York, and that's gonna get me through a lot of things. Oh, good. <laughs> Well, I'm glad you've got that vision to see you through this terrible uh, time. I know. And it, today is a rare, extremely happy day for me. It sounds like it. You've got a lot of laughs today. It is. Today. I do have a lot of laughs today. I don't, I'm not going to analyze it. Don't I'm going with it. it. Just yep. as, Until yeah. I stop feeling this way. I started feeling really bad last night because we've been pushing the subscription challenge to our listeners <laughs> and haven't done it. And I feel like, well, what terrible hosts are we? We're not even, we're setting right. a terrible example. No, that was just my own guilt. So I'm going to do it. I'm going to pull up my credit card statement at some point this week. Well, c- cancel some stuff that I don't need and report back. I did want to let you know that there is a couple of apps out there that will do it for you. A lot of these apps, what you can do is, and we'll post these on our page. And a lot of them, what you do is you go and you load in your various accounts. And all you have to do is go saying that you have like an Amex card and then you put in your Amex login information and it logs in and automatically does it. So you could just sit down and do all that. And then the list is done for you. That's great. I'm going to do that. Right. Well, um, so there's a few out there. Truebill. I used to have Mint, which Mint was just to track my expenses. As I'm looking now, there's a shitload of them. I guess it just depends on what would be the best for your current situation. I think that I'm going to do that because I think it'll minimize yeah. half the work going on. Yeah, I think so. Nope. Send me those links and we'll put them in the show notes. So, Lawrence, there's a bit of news yes. today. Okay. So there's a small article, um, film and TV shoots resume in China as the restrictions ease on the population there. So oh. I think there's many qualifiers to this because communist country yeah. and the restrictions were pretty heavy. There, you know, making people stay in their houses, drones to shame them back inside, (laughs) like all kinds of shit was going on more that we I'm sure we don't know about because Internet is monitored. So the move follows attempts to lift restrictions and restart the economy across the country, which included reopening cinemas and tourist attractions, as well as allowing schools to begin classes again. However, cinemas were abruptly closed again, along with other entertainment venues you know, because they're trying to curb a second wave. Mm. Production chiefs appear to have instituted strict regulations to ensure shoots can continue, including quarantine for film crew and a requirement to prove knowledge of epidemic prevention. Mm. Local authorities has also provided financial incentives, such as subsidies for equipment rental and catering to encourage producers to keep shooting. Now, all of this said, the studios that are shooting right now or filming right now are state run. Oh. Yeah. So I'm not sure that an agency from the U.S. could do a commercial in no. China oh, right now. Right, right, but Meaning right. like, okay, oh, right, so right, sure. like we were talking about several weeks ago is can like- Can we go somewhere can and we, shoot somewhere else? Yeah. yeah. Can we country hop? Right. Yeah. Like, can we all go to Australia? <laughs> <laughs> Follow their rule book? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I mean, coming from New York, I would need to go to Australia and then quarant- self-quarantine for two weeks and then could go yeah. out into the public. So I do think there's some hurdles to go still. And of course, it you know, qualifying that it's still China. But all of that said, it looks like their uh, studios are starting to ramp back up over there. So a state-run studio would be like if Donald Trump owned a 
film <laughs> studio right now. <laughs> and he decided it was safe enough for them to start working. If he decided, that's the thing. If, if he decided, yeah. Yeah, versus if it's what's right for room tone. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Good call back. <laughs> well, I saw this other article. We'll post a link to that article in the show notes. So I saw this other one in the LA Times. Aid to unemployment freelancers lag as California officials await federal guidance. I've heard about this with banks and everything when it comes to like the small business loans. Yeah. So the small business loans were supposed to be happening last Friday and all the banks said we're not ready. Apparently now they are. And you can file for unemployment in California as a freelancer. But this article says a new federal law, that's the CARES Act, gives freelancers desperately needed unemployment insurance coverage in the wake of the coronavirus pandemic. But California employment officials have yet to implement the new rules because they're awaiting federal guidance. That means that for <laughs> now, there is no way for freelancers to apply for assistance unless they claim they were misclassified employees or had mm. voluntarily paid into the unemployment insurance program individually or through an employer, none of which is required under the new federal law. Right. California is one of the biggest gig economy states in the country. So I mean, I'm sure New York is as well, but it's like that needs to get figured out and figured out quickly. It does because, you know, in, in, see, in seeing what I'm seeing when it comes to small business loans, right, what the major holdup is, A, we enacted this and I understand it was fast. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I, I completely get that it needed to happen right away. And but nobody was really prepared for it to be enacted. And every single state has old systems that people yeah. unemployment. It's been at three percent for years, let's say. Yeah, it's been at below five percent, five to six percent for years. So nobody's updated their system. So all of a sudden, 10 to 15 percent of people are starting to apply for all of these things, if not even a higher percentage. Let's just say on the low point, it's, you know, 15 percent of people out there mm -hmm. are overwhelming the systems. There's no right. proper guidance right yep. now. And states and banks and individuals are begging for help. And there's yeah. not enough government, quote unquote, to help right now. I was listening to a podcast yesterday, either The Daily or Marketplace or something, and they said that it's not so much the money that's the problem, it's the system to get yes. people to the money that's the problem. And it, it would be like taking Fifth Avenue from New York and making all those cars drive down a country road. <laughs> the system is not built for it. <laughs> that's a great analogy. I thought it was pretty good. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty good. From what I, my understanding is, each bank that is offering these loans, you know, you can go to your bank. If you are a member of the bank that you're going to, then or have an account there, you will, this is for small businesses, you will be bumped to the front of the line of whatever mm -hmm. their applications are. But then once every, all these individual banks get the process down and the phone calls over and are ready to approve, they have to manage manually upload it. And um, that's what's taking even an abnormally larger amount of time. Right. Is the upload. Yeah. Because that's where the bank is getting the money from to give to you. And yeah. the banks are afraid that if they don't upload it and they hurriedly approve something to you and they don't upload it or have done something wrong, the government's going to say, sorry, we're not approving that loan. So that's why the banks are holding. And it's just. Well, I want to remind everybody there is a Zoom webinar Thursday for people who are in the entertainment industry and need to file unemployment. It's with the EDD and IOTC and a bunch of industry associations. It's at 10 a.m. Thursday, this Thursday. What is that? The, the 9th? Yes. And there's a link to that to register for the Zoom conference in our show notes. And uh, we're going to take a listen in and try and report back any information we can get as good as two non-reporters can. <laughs> yes, as, two, as good as two people with a brain possibly yes. can do. So. All right. Uh, we have two voice memos we should get to. <gasps> yes. Um, Love these. See. First, we have Ashish Singh Nadal, who is a creative producer from India. Nice. Yeah. So let's take a listen. Hi there. My name is Ashish Nandal. I am a senior post producer at Hogarth Worldwide, based in New Delhi, India. I work full time for this company. During these strange days, uh, 
वी आर सींग सम स्लो डाउन इन द जॉब्स इन कमिंग जॉब्स फ्रॉम आर क्लाइंट्स सो मेजरली डिपेंडिंग ऑन द टाइप ऑफ क्लाइंट्स वी हैव लाइक ऑटोमोबाइल क्लाइंट्स एंड अदर क्लाइंट्स इन देर वी सी इट विल स्लो डाउन रेस्ट एवरी थिंग इज गोइंग एज इज आई एल से फॉर मी आई डोंट सी एनी चैलेंज आई सी द वर्ल्ड विल डेफिनेटली चेंज द काइंड ऑफ दैट वे पीपल वर्क in this industry will definitely change after this quarantine and covid stage as of now a recent example one of my client for them we manage their social media channel a youtube and instagram channel it's a pharma channel and we used to do one interview a week a doctor from any city or a or any industry after this lockdown and we are facing from past 15 to 20 days and we are not able to shoot any of them but now finally i have a uh, agreed client to do a virtual shoot and keep the ball rolling so for doing virtual shoot i am using a zoom app or any particular video con conferencing app and motivating doctors or motivating doctors to shoot on their own from their iphone or any smartphone they have simultaneously and successfully we have uh, got two three videos with us and now we are doing the post packaging and the finally the videos will go live as is and things are going in a better way and we are not stopping ourselves because of changing times and we will definitely not similarly on the audio part if we d- will get requirements we will use voices.com as per the agreement of our clients or we reach out for individual freelancers as per the requirement i like hearing birds chirping in the background of that i do um thanks ashish good to hear from somebody on the other side of the world and how you guys are getting through i think it's part of what we uh discussed before you know obviously figuring out a way to do something in this time and he sounds like he's got some pretty solid ideas and convincing client to do yeah. it i think is um not letting half this, the battle right n- yeah and not letting this kind of stop them it's great no, i think it's great Lawrence, we have another voice memo today. Very excited. We have two. Um, Jonathan Bentley, uh, he's a cameraman from Dallas, Texas. Let's listen in. Hello. My name is Jonathan Bentley. I live in Dallas, Texas. I'm a Dallas cameraman, freelancer, been here for, you know, 30 years. I'm not working right now. No, I don't have any work lined up. I lost probably $30,000 worth of work through August. I'm not really worried about it, to be honest. Now, my wife's unemployed as well, but we got a beautiful home. All our bills are paid. I think we can survive. You know, there's money being saved by sitting at home. You got to admit that. But beyond that, I know this industry is going to come back. Now, it may not come back till the fall. Some are predicting next year, but you know what? Hey, I'm not worried about it. I do have a hobby or two at the house. You know, I got a classic car in the garage. You know, there's some things that I enjoy doing, mainly spending time with my family. We even got the bikes out. We started bike riding again in the neighborhood. You know, do everyone a favor, including yourself. Pray to God. So I think Jonathan's. it sounds like he's keeping a good attitude about him and his wife. You know, they're out of work, but it's out of their control right now. That was a very touching message. It actually brought a little tear to my eye just to hear him so flatly saying, throwing up his hands and saying, we got nothing. We're out of work. I lost all this money, but it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay because he's right. The industry will come back. We don't know when and we don't know quite how it's going to be structured. But in the end, TV shows need to be made, films need to be made, live events need to go on, and Mm -hmm. advertising is key. So, yeah. Yeah. It's still going to happen. happen. In some way, shape, or form, somewhere down the road. So, Jonathan, thank you for sending that in. That was a really lovely message, and good luck to you and your family. 
All right, Christian, again, on our Take Action page, we've got some things on there for everybody. I put on your mask making links that you sent. We also have Donate Blood. Yeah, put the Donate Blood on there. Your link to the No Rent in New York City petition. Sign it. And the Live Events Coalition website for all you live event folks out there to uh, sign their petition. Yes. And um, again, we've mentioned it before, but the Zoom conference about uh, how to file unemployment insurance if you're an entertainment industry worker goes live at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific, Pacific on Thursday, yes. the 9th. Correct. Mm -hmm. Thursday, the 9th, this week. And then Garcetti posted somewhere a list of some services for Los Angeles. I'm going to put that on there. I don't know if you, Christian, if you have anything like that for New York, but I'll throw these up there as well on our Take Action page on our website, producershappyhour.com. All right, let's get on with our interview. Yes. Sandrine Orabona is a documentary filmmaker with over two decades of experience in film, television, and advertising. She focuses primarily on highly personal, character-based storytelling, her subjects ranging from ordinary people with extraordinary stories to the personal and intimate sides of larger-than-life icons. Sandrine's credits include Lady Valor, the Kristen Beck story, State of Play, First Ladies, and This Is It, where she followed Michael Jackson in the final weeks of his life. She is currently finishing a documentary for PBS on the decades-long jazz scene in South Central Los Angeles. Let's take a listen. Sandrine, thank you so much for joining us. Yes. Thanks for having me. Do you mind letting us know where you're located in this country? Are you in the country? Are you? Yeah, I'm in Los Angeles, California at the moment. Nice. And then um, first, we'd love to check in on how you're doing, how your family doing. Yeah, I mean, from a health perspective, everybody's okay. From a from a physical health perspective, I think it's been interesting uh, from kind of a mental health perspective. Mm, yeah. People, I think, you know, now we're on kind of week three in L.A., People are, are starting to kind of get a little bit restless. Also, you know, running around and trying to, you know, get a small business loan, all that kind of all the little things that we're normally used to. Um, you know, my partner is a producer, as you know, Lawrence, mm -hmm. uh, and, and everybody's very solutions and action oriented. So this can be a little trying for, mm -hmm. for those of us who are just so used to, to putting one foot in front of the other and getting things done. And OK, this is not an option. So this is an option. So um, that's <laughs> kind of, you know, that that's why I think everyone else is at. I also have and, and my partner has family in Europe, um, me specifically in France. So we're about a, a week behind them in terms of, you know, like the stay at home orders and and they have significantly more stringent rules there. So I've been checking mm -hmm. in with them uh, in terms of how they're doing. And thankfully, everyone's physically healthy. But I think it's definitely, you know, the mental health component to this is something that people have already started writing about. So I want to get a little bit of a background on you and your career path and everything sure. that was kind of leading up to the pandemic. And then maybe we can dive into what happened to you in terms of projects you had in the works when the pandemic hit. I went to school for journalism. And uh, uh -huh. yeah, there we go. it shows. It shows. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> but um, when I was in school, I realized that the way that they were educating journalists was not the way that I wanted to go. That can be a comment on this current state of, of, <laughs> of news or not. You can take it however you want. Yeah, but I've always been really interested, and I started in high school. I've always been—I basically had a camera on my shoulder, following my friends around since I was wow. 14 years old. I think it just kind of naturally happened when when I was of age to start paying my rent. I had to kind of pick a line and and go with it, and so I I chose nonfiction editing. So I was an editor, and and Lawrence knows this because he's known me for a better part of my life now. Um, I was an editor in nonfiction editing for close to 20 years. And through, through my career, I just kind of moved on to like what they call a predator, a producer editor in the television world is someone that makes decisions in the Bay. And then I started yeah. kind of getting out of the Bay and becoming a producer, shooter, editor, and then eventually became a director. And I've been, I've been directing documentary films now for at least like maybe seven years consistently out of the editing room. But I still I still do a lot of like shooting on my own. And I, I don't edit all of my stuff because I like to be collaborative and not have everything on on my shoulders. But I do a lot of editing work when I'm directing as well. What did you have? What was happening as the pandemic took hold? Right. 
I know you, you had some projects in development. Did things get shut down or postponed? Or I don't know what you're at liberty to talk about. But So we, have, we had a, um, a documentary with PBS and KCET that was on the jazz scene in South L.A., uh, we were literally going to turn in our for our fine cut when like the week that everything shut down. And again, because I have a background in post, I just put everything on drives on two different drives. And right. we, we edited remotely with with my editor. So we were able to finish the fine cut and we're going to be, you know, starting the mix. At least that can be done remotely. You know, yep. I can send a lot of AAF files across to my mixer. I just won't be able to QC it. But after we're done with that, we just have to kind of wait and stop down to finish. So we were able to kind of get it at least to the creative, sort of the creative finish line, about 80%. And we have uh, approval. So that's great. We, we were going to start a couple of projects, which, you know, in production, that's, that's not an option right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We have a couple of things in the can already, such as a, a project that I shot like a about a year ago that we're in collaboration with Herzog company, who is um, one of the biggest documentary companies in town. And I used to work for those guys too. So Mm -hmm. I was going to have someone else edit the sizzle, but it looks like it's going to be me. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I have time. So that's going to be it. But, but I also did, did get off the phone and, and I have a, a few deals in town to direct a couple of documentaries with other companies because I also, I have my own company, but I also source myself out. Right. And and I did have a pitch meeting yesterday. And uh, what I can tell you is it was very interesting in terms of Mm. what people are looking for. And Mm. what it seems to me is that if you've got something in the can already, you're already ahead of most people. Right. It, it seems like that they're they're really the companies are really putting a focus on people who can start something right now. And so, you know, from a documentary film perspective, you know, this is a little bit different than people who are in the commercial world. Right. And, and of I course. kind of I have a hand I have a foot one foot in one world, one foot in the other. Right. So but from a documentary film perspective, like if you have something that deals with archival, if you have something where you've shot something already and it's it's well on its way it certainly puts you in a great position to be talking to buyers right now. Wow. Um, and we I do think of that. And we do, we do have a couple of things already, already in the can. Oh, so, really, really? Yeah. There are people actively looking for content mm-hmm. right now. Yeah. Because a lot of Nothing's what, what they had going is not going to be able to get made right now. Yeah. So uh, there are people that are actively looking for content because a lot of people are watching it too, by the way. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, like, yeah. Um, yeah. I just finished Netflix yesterday. So. Right. Um, <laughs> I... Right. But understandably, you know, there's, there's several different moving parts to our industry. Right. So there's like the, the kind of the narrative film and television world. Right. So that's yeah. going to be, that's going to be affected that you can't really do anything with that. Um, There's the commercial world where I've already seen people get pretty creative and repurposing mm -hmm. material, you know, again, being an editor is a really good skill to have these days because I know a lot of friends of mine who are editors who can continue to work because it can be repurposed and whatever, you know, and then the third part is, you know, this kind of like new premium documentary world, which thankfully we've kind of moved into that territory as documentary filmmakers, we're no longer kind of like the low budget people now. Mm-hmm. We're actually yeah, like, yeah. you know. Yeah. And so if, again, if you have something, if you have something where you can start moving forward, right, because you've shot something or you have access to archival or whatever, that certainly puts you in a place uh, where people are are going to take a, a strong look at you, I think. Along those lines, how do you think this, you know, pandemic will affect you as a filmmaker? So I'm not an economist, but I, but I do see see how it, it affected everybody right um mm-hmm. after 9-11 and and certainly you know a recession is is bound to happen but that said i'm in a really nimble part of the business right, right. because mm-hmm. as again i my partner's a producer i've i've watched like multi-million dollar productions happen and how they happen and and i'm constantly amazed at the ability to like move what looks to be the titanic from left to right but it's going to be a little bit harder here. I, I, I run around a lot of times. I do some higher end production work, but like 
lot of times when I'm doing a documentary, it's me, another camera person, a sound person, and maybe like a production person who's like right. helping us get around. That's it. I'm already it's nimble. Right. So I'm all, I'm already pretty nimble as as things go. I'm not saying that it's not going to affect me, but I already don't cost a lot of money. <laughs> like, so, <laughs> Your overhead is it's yeah. just smaller. And that's just the nature of like what I do. Like, yeah, exactly. It, obviously, there are things that we do, you know, when when we bring lights and do interviews and, right. you know, we, we do bring. But even even those parts of the production are still tiny compared to like what you do, Lawrence, you know, yeah, like yeah. so. But you've done a lot of branded content, so you understand, you know, how to mm -hmm. scale down. I yeah. think for me, like if I'm looking forward for the film industry in general, is I think people are just going to have to learn how to be a, a little bit more nimble in general. Right. And, and, mm -hmm. and, and by that, I don't necessarily mean paying people less because I think right. that's going to be where all the bigger companies are going to want to go. Right. Yeah. Uh -huh. But I do think that there's there's a lot of waste in our industry, like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, you know, in general. And I and I feel like this is a really good time, especially with technology, like to mm -hmm. really trim the fat and and kind of look at like what do we really need in order to get this accomplished and again it's not about paying the human resource less it's about right. figuring out what resources we really do need and i think that translates on a bigger scale to what the issue is at hand right now is that we've been screwing with the environment and we've been super mm. wasteful with the environment and for us to start thinking that way because the economy is forcing us to think that way i think is not a bad thing when we think of like, how can we prevent this in the future? Because really this is caused by our wastefulness. This has come up several times in, in our podcast that, uh, you know, if someone called it the great pause and a friend mm -hmm. of mine was saying, it's like, <laughs> it's, it's so like the earth just shut down everything and said, hey, you guys need to take a time out. You're consuming too much. You're polluting too much. It's time to stop and just remember what it is to be human. I do think that you answered from a very structured and financial and practical way, but also too, how is it going to affect you artistically or emotionally as a filmmaker? Well, right now, uh, outside of like doing creatively, yeah, yeah, outside of doing all the things that I'm doing, like I, what I know how to do is collect information in order to put a story together, right? right. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and and Lawrence, that's what you've been seeing in my in my Instagram post, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. like. What I've been doing is I've been collecting information because I'm trying to figure out what the story is, right? Mm -hmm. And and for me, like whenever there's any kind of social or personal like story to be told, like I'm trying to figure out like where it's coming from. So creatively, like if I get to tell a story about about this, then at least I'll have the tools. Creatively in the future, how that's gonna affect me, like I have a computer at home, I have a camera, it's mm -hmm. you know, it's small, like what I use my tools can't get any smaller. Right. right. So, so they're not going to, that's not going to affect, I think if anything that's going to get affected is the economy. Right. And so how right. that translates, mm -hmm. how that translates to me is something that I'll, I'll have to see, or we'll have to see. But again, we can make a series like, like a six part series on just about, if not, you know, the budget that most commercials are made for 30 seconds. So that that's not to say that like some network isn't going to turn around and tell and tell me hey you have less money that's not what I'm saying but like I guess as uh, documentary filmmakers I think we're just a, possibly a little bit more prepared already mm -hmm. like we we've learned to mm -hmm. be super nimble with our resources anyhow and if there's any good thing about technology I mean like that's allowed us to be more nimble and more independent and I think that's something to look at on a, on a, on a larger scale I mean. I understand that you can't make certain commercials on the type of budgets that you can make a documentary on, but maybe it's time to look at how to scale down those resources a little bit in general. hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah. You know, you know, I always feel like documentaries are so much a reflection of the human experience. Right. And obviously it seems like, and we're in the thick of it. So it's hard for us to really know that the human experience is going to be different coming out of this. Do you have a sense of our narrative stories or documentary stories going to change coming out of this? Do you see a big shift in the stories people want to talk about or tell or research? Obviously, you you are, you know, researching what is happening literally right now. Do you think there's going to be a, a bit of a, a shift for all types of filmmakers in terms of what content they're putting out? I think any reality that we come out of is going to be really just based on what we want collectively, right? So. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean, 
we could go either way. <laughs> we yeah. could keep going yeah. down the direction that we've been going and, and, and kind of allow our resources to constrict and our story to become that way. Or we could expand in other ways and we could start telling stories about solutions and, and how humans came up with solutions and what we want for our future and why and how to get there. I don't know if you know about David Byrne, the guy from the Talking Heads. Mm-hmm. He, he has a, a website and, a, and an Instagram um, handle called Reasons to be Cheerful. And, and he tells stories based on people who have already come up with solutions and that are working on solutions rather than coming, just telling the stories about the problem, right? I went down to Occupy LA back in 2009, 2010, whenever it was. And I was spending some time down there. And, and one of the things, I got to meet a lot of really great career activists, right? People, because if you're an activist, you're not an activist for six months, you're not an activist for a, a year. This is your life, you know? Yeah. And, you know, people from the nurses union, people who from the housing union, Navy SEALs, you know, it was quite an interesting kind of blend of people. And the one thing that I did come away with, right, is that you could kind of do, you could do content that is just about the problem, right? But if you only do that, then people are going to like walk away and they're also going to be depressed. But if you do Mm. content that you don't have to shy away from the problem, right? But if yeah. you do content that that offers up a solution, it might not necessarily be the solution for you, but that there is a solution out there, you're giving people actionable steps towards a solution. And I think hopefully that's the kind of content that we're going to see, because that's kind of what we're all going to need in order to motivate each other. Mm-hmm. One of the things that that that's really interesting to me, I was thinking about this, like about like all my producer friends. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, like, no, really, because I and I I, I have one at at home. And and I think, you know, when I'm thinking about like what's going on right now is I'm thinking about like, how would a producer handle this? Right. And the first thing is like, you know, you, you have to face the problem and come up with a solution. Right. On a set. That doesn't always make you the most popular person. Right. (laughs) Right. As, As part of the crew. But it is what's needed. Right. And and without being pessimistic, that's just how you solve a problem. Yeah. So first we have to understand the reality of the problem and what the solutions are. The second thing is you, you have to stop dealing with things like little fires, right? Of course we have to deal with what's in front of us, but if you're constantly allowing fires to come up in front of you, like you're not dealing with the larger scale solution that's coming down the road. And, And the former surgeon general said this yesterday on Twitter is like, we have to come up with solutions in March that we can implement in May, right? So, so we right. do have to be forward thinking right now. And, and that's what producers do. Like you got to mm-hmm. like see the problem before it happens so that you can put solutions in place before mm-hmm. they happen. And that's the thing that needs to happen right now, right? And again, that's not being pessimistic. That's just applying producer logic. Mm-hmm. And, and the third thing, and I think the, one of the most important things is that I love about my, you know, my good producers is that they have a really finely tuned bullshit meter, right? So, (laughs) so like sift through the bullshit, you know, like, like there's a lot of it coming at us and I'm not suggesting that you don't trust the government or the media, but I am suggesting that maybe we like tweak our bullshit meter a little bit. Just on yesterday's episode, there was an Mm -hmm. article I read called It's Time to Cut the Bullshit. It was just a white paper on LinkedIn that somebody wrote, but it was exactly that. I mean, it was talking a lot about marketing messages, but it was also talking about humanity. And like our bullshit meters now are so sensitive and so high that none of it's going to fly right now. And it's time to kind of cut all that crap and get a little more human. And I think to your point, too, it's like, yeah, it's coming at us from all angles and it's not to be conspiracy theorist but sometimes the truth isn't what the mass public needs to be told well and and i think it's also it's it's ed- in order to do that we have to educate ourselves and i'm going to go back to there has never been a better time to get educated than in the age of the internet i mean oh, i yeah. You know, and we have the time right now. So like I'm sitting here listening to council meetings. I'm following epidemiologists and they're like, great, listen to us. Like, I mean, I'm not saying anything against either the administration or the New York Times or the L.A. Times or like whatever. But like I need to educate myself in order for me to be able to ask for, you know, actual solutions. You're from France. Do you still have family there right now? Yes. 
And uh, are you getting any information from them just about what's happening? What's their reality like? Is it anything different than what we're seeing in, in the news? I don't know what you guys are seeing in the news because I'm reading French newspapers. Exactly. So, right. so yeah. So what is happening right now is that, again, they have significantly more stringent regulations in place, which is kind of a difficult thing for people. Like we certainly are at least able to go out and run and, and mm -hmm. you know, but that said, they also have more of a social net in place, right? So, you know, rents have been canceled, mortgages have been canceled, you know, all, all kinds of things that we're mm -hmm. still kind of trying to scramble and figure out yeah. how we're going to deal with stuff. Yeah. I think it also is based on the, the one thing that I will say, and I, you've seen me post about this a lot, is that Germany's got it together, man. Like they oh, yeah. and France doesn't necessarily. And I'm not necessarily surprised um, <laughs> because I know my French people. But again, and coming back up with like actionable solutions. Right. Germans, yep. they got yes. them. right. Yeah. Testing beds, the medical system. You know, there's no secret. Right. Which is, yeah. So that's the information that we're getting is France has not put all the resources together that Germany has. And Germany is right. doing a lot better than France and Italy and Spain. Well, wasn't Angela Merkel a, a quantum? Does she have a doctorate in quantum chemistry or something like that? Yep. Yeah. She's super mm. smart. <laughs> <laughs> not saying that anyone isn't. I'm just yeah. saying like, I mean, well, she's. A, yeah. Well, but she knows you know, about quantum. Yeah, sure. Chemistry. Well, yeah. but the the one thing the one thing that's really interesting, and again, I'm like, uh, it's it's depending on what side of the political spectrum you fall on. Certainly, you know, we can argue that the federal government isn't necessarily responding to this in the way that they should be. Sure. But what's more important for us right now, frankly, is to focus on the communal level and our councilmen and women and our representatives in Congress. Mm -hmm. And our governor, and because it's kind of how the country is built anyway, it's it's not centralized from the perspective of making like decisions. Thank God. Yes, <laughs> yes. But that doesn't mean we don't hold people like Diane Feinstein, who sold her stocks, to task. Uh -huh. I'm sorry, like she yeah, didn't. yep. Let's just call it what it is, like totally. Or Kamala Harris, you who was on the Intelligence Committee, you know, who should have known about this as well. Karen mm -hmm. Bass, at least, who's our district, you know, representative mm -hmm. is holding like phone calls and conference calls. So that's, you know, that's it. But it, I think it's it's too easy to have a villain and a get like one villain because there it, it's not really that it black. It doesn't work light. that way. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, it doesn't and, work and, that way. and again, it if there's one thing that I learned from being a documentary filmmaker and from going down to Occupy it's that it's also, we tend to be like, okay, I'm going to vote for this person. And then I've done my civic duty and then like, I'm out. Right. And I'm yeah. going to live my life. Right. And this is an example of why that doesn't necessarily work that way. Right. Yeah. And we, again, we have no better time right now. Like, like even if we're trying to run our business at this point, we're still kind of doing it at 50% capacity. So yeah. there's no better time right now than to call, write, tweet, Mm -hmm. You know, like, and that's kind of what I've been doing. But the best way to do that, though, is not being like, you did this wrong and you did that wrong. And, you know, it's more like, here's what we expect out of you, because here's what the science is telling us that or the solutions are. So here's what we expect out of you. Yeah, I think another overarching thing that we've gotten out of this podcast is that instantly our world's got a lot smaller. Mm -hmm. Now we're watching Eric Garcetti speak every day at 515. We're more focused on local politics and, you know, what's going to happen with our homeless and what's going to happen with our rents and all these smaller issues that I think got kind of lost in the ether for the past, I don't know, eight years or something when all we could look at was, you know, this presidential divide, getting back to local politics and making sure that, you know, mm -hmm. you're putting your representatives to task at the smallest level is probably the most beneficial thing that people can be doing right now. And there's two things, right, that I'll, I'll add to that. Number one, like when you put your representative to task at the communal level in Los Angeles, you're still making a giant impact. Yes. Because yeah. we are, because yeah, yeah. We, we're a huge city. Yeah. That cannot be understated, right? Yes. Like, like yeah, yeah. we're not a small commune in the middle of Idaho. Like, 
everything we do has a ripple effect in in the larger scheme of the the state and then the country right absolutely so yeah. that's one thing so if you can get more motivated that way that's one thing the other thing what was really interesting the other day is like for the first time in my life i listened to a council meeting and the sheriff was basically trying to take over the emergency response teams and the council people were like no this is a multi agency mm task force. It always has been and it always will be. And it doesn't make sense for the police force and the sheriff to be heading the emergency response. And I was yeah. like, thank God. Like, <laughs> because yeah. outside of like, I mean, Villanueva hasn't necessarily been getting the best press to begin with the last few months. A, B, as much as like the police has a very specific way that they go about things. And again, following the advice of constitutional lawyers, they're like, they are not the best people to be keeping the social distancing measures in place because they're trained a certain way mm -hmm. and they're just not the, the right people to be leading the whole response. Certainly right. to lead one part of the response, but not all. And that's when I was like, wow, I really need to be paying a little bit more attention mm -hmm. to my local politics because thankfully yeah. my council people made that decision for me. But if I didn't know what was going on, I was I would be like I could be stuck with like a really bad decision. Mm -hmm. So and again, like like maybe in normal times, I don't necessarily need to be as involved. But right now I have no excuse. Like, yeah, I can yeah, put yeah, on exactly. in the background. Like, yeah. you know, the homeless problem in here in Los Feliz, where I live, is getting really, really bad, has been bad for a while. And I wanted to mm -hmm. run for just neighborhood council. Right. Yes. Which yes. is a volunteer position. However, you have to commit to 20 hours a week and I just don't have it as right. much. And I know that sounds like a terrible excuse, but I travel so much for work. I'm never home. I'm never here. I don't know what I thought I would be able to do with all that travel and work, but, it, but like it inspired me to get involved. And I think this at least pay attention, at least right. communicate with whoever is my neighborhood council person right. going forward. And I think this is a good time as well for people to, to really dial into that. I think awareness is the most you can be doing right now. Yeah. Awareness and education. I mean, the rest of it, whether or not you're going to have time to do it now or later, it's it's not about that. It's more about being educated. Exactly. And yeah. that's that's the biggest civic duty you've got. Yep. I yep. I completely agree. I do know on a smaller level, um, if you give to your neighborhood, if you search in your immediate area for charities instead of giving to a large conglomerate, if you're giving to something local and you've assessed a need, you do so much more on a local level, no matter what. I think that's it's a fantastic idea. And Lawrence, I've also too, like toyed with running for something local. I think mm -hmm. it just means a, a lifestyle change. Yeah, completely. Which... Like taking um, less jobs or figuring out where your passion is. But I don't know if it necessarily means a lifestyle change. You can still be involved by being educated and then, yes, that, you know, give, yes. giving what you can. Of course. You know, and, and again, like there's, I, we did a documentary on um, education and, you know, going back to the communal level, it's like the other reason why it's really important to get involved at the communal level is because what's good for your community is not necessarily good for a community in Chicago mm -hmm. because they have right. different needs. And that, mm -hmm. that's okay. This kind of one size fits all approach to like solution-based approach. It doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. It makes no sense even in a smaller country like France that has all these different regions. And it really doesn't make any sense in the United States. So right now, actually the best thing that we could have is that the federal government isn't taking charge of all the different states mm -hmm. and for right. any reasons. Sandrine, one last question before we let you go. Thank you for spending time with us today. What are you looking forward to when this is all over? And that's a really open question. It could either be your favorite restaurant being open or it could be a, <laughs> a new way the, right. of, of, of treating each other when once we're all out of this. What, what are you looking forward to once we're through the other side? So there's two things. Uh, one, one, on a professional level, I, I'm really looking forward to getting back to doing what I love, which is being in a room with a camera with people and you know, mm. filming, you know, right now that's obviously really complicated yeah. and, and just kind of ob observing you know, humans and how they do things. So, you know, I love that. Mm. And so I, I'm very much looking forward to that. On a personal level, I can't wait to get back in the water. <laughs> yes. Like, I, I'm a surfer. Yeah. And, and uh, You're a and, daily surfer, right? Yeah. And I, I can't. I mean, I could, 
if I really wanted to sneak out, but I just don't don't think it's worth worth no. giving it a shot right now. There's a bunch of people that I see on the on Surfline in the mornings, but I'm I'm just gonna keep running. But yeah, I can't wait to get back in the water. Nice. Well, hopefully that'll happen soon. So, All right, Sandrine, ooh. thank you so much. Thank Thanks, you guys. so much for your time. I feel like after every time we do an interview, I feel more like my the perspective has grown in my mind and that I have um, hope. And thank you for this. We really appreciate it. No, I mean, I'm really um, grateful for you guys to do this. I think it's it's really important to get people's perspective out there mm. right now and not just like what's coming at you. Yeah. So in a exactly. lot of ways, in a lot of ways, you guys are documentarians right now, whether or not you realize it. You guys are documenting this. I'm going to come back to you. <laughs> I'm going to come back to you when I need archival. All right. <laughs> Sounds oh, thank good. That would be an, our honor. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Wow. Let's talk about well, okay. mo- energy. Holy smokes! I mean, yeah. that is a level of energy that I, I I would aspire to. Just so practical and so refreshing. How she's turned her experiences and her education, like everything she does, is just very focused. Mm-hmm. Definitely aspirational. Yeah, see, I knew it would be an interesting conversation because documentary filmmakers, it is about the human experience. And it is about collecting information. And that's kind of all we can be doing right now is watching this experience happen and collecting as much information as possible. I liked what she said, though, about focusing on the solutions and not the problem, which is something I think you and I probably live and die by in our daily lives. Yeah. That is a good way of, you know, reframing this moment. You know, stay aware and informed. Pay attention to your local politics, your local, your local representatives. Because if you know, if you know what's happening and you're not happy with it, then it might inspire you to change something. But if you stay ignorant, you're not going to know that, oh, somebody just took over this whole task force and you didn't even know about it. That's a a good lesson. And I think, you know, we were talking about wanting to get involved in our local politics. It was good. I just enjoyed that conversation because it really sparked me to get back into that mindset. Agreed. And I also, uh, I think that it can be overwhelming for some people, like how to start or how to, you know, like manage their time along with somebody else's. You don't have to do it alone. There are sources that you can go to one or two sources that have summed it all up for you as well. Exactly. So it's just about finding how much time that you can commit, but also understanding you're part of the world too. And you should pay, you know, attention if you'd like to. Yeah, I think that's it for today, right? That is it. Boy, the time flew again today. Thanks to Sandrine Orabona for taking the time to chat with us. Uh, We're going to put her contact information and her Instagram in the show notes. I'll double check to make sure she'll let us. But uh, you should follow her and see the stuff she's posting. It's all very interesting. I'm going Uh, to follow her right now, actually. So uh, tag me on the next post. I will. I will. And then also I'm going to find, I think it was Reasons to be Cheerful, David Burns' uh, Instagram, too. We'll put that in the show notes as well. But until tomorrow, guys, stay safe, stay connected, stay active, and also please stay home. Stay home uh, for me (laughs) and for your fellow (laughs) citizens, please. Yes. Wash your hands and be using some lotion because now I'm sure they're like uh, sandpaper. I've recovered. I've recovered my hands. They were so bad. And I've just been so diligent with the lotion after every hand wash that I'm I'm getting back to some sort of normalcy with my hands. So thank you. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. I think um, well, if I was that disciplined, boy, what I what I have even more done. So <laughs> uh don't touch your face and wear a mask if you go outside. That's important. Yes. As Lawrence said earlier, just think that you have the virus and that you're yeah, contagious. You're Act carrier. like that. Exactly. Like that. Yes. Mm-hmm. And be sure to send us your voice recordings or your emails to producershappyhour at gmail.com. Lawrence, how do people reach you directly? They can get me at lawrencetlewis.com or for voiceover work, voiceoflawrence.com. Christian, how do people get a hold of you? They can get me at sisterchristianproduces.com. All right. Until tomorrow. Until tomorrow. Um, Who do we have again tomorrow? Oh, tomorrow we're going to have Beth Shulman who is an agency producer from yes. Australia. Oh, another, Beth. another voice from down under. Very excited because yes. um, her agency view, you know, we, we spoke to production director folks yesterday from yep. Blue Society and Revolver and tomorrow getting a agency perspective is going to round out the circle. It is. Yes. Yes. So. All right, guys. See you tomorrow. Bye.